That and the idea of metaphor, man. Nobody's teaching metaphor anymore. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Jeffrey Boyd. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. I am your host, Hank Garner. You can find all of the archives of the show at hankgarner.com. And while you're there, please click on the subscribe links over on the right-hand sidebar. You can subscribe on your Android phone, your iPhone, it's Stitcher Radio, anywhere that you listen to podcasts, you can find Author Stories. We're also on YouTube. There's a link over in the right ha- right-hand sidebar as well. And you can subscribe there and never miss an episode. Today's episode is sponsored by the AIPP, the Association of Independent Publishing Professionals. If you are an indie author and you need to build a support team to help you uh, format your book, edit your book, get a cover design for your book, the anything that an indie author needs to get their book out there, the AIPP has a member that can help you make your book your product the very best it can be. If you look in the uh, show notes at the bottom of this episode, you'll find a link to the AIPP or go to AIPPonline.org slash members and browse through the member library and find the professional to fill out your team. Like I said, anything that you need to make your indie publishing journey a success, there's a member there to help. It's a very simple website, very easy to navigate through. Go check out AIPPonline.org slash members today and fill out your indie author team. At the end of the show, be sure to stick around for an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thanks for listening. He enlisted for the money. He stayed for the girl. Gateway to the Galaxy, the new series everyone is talking about, beginning with Book One, Into the Breach. Frank and Marine Space Corps One find themselves across the galaxy in a WWE SmackDown with the legions of a boss-level villain. But the party's just getting started. He donned the mantle of a celestial knight to impress a girl, well, an empress. Now destiny's calling in a death. A lightning-paced military fantasy full of outlandish comedy and impossible situations that will have you hailing for these Marines from the get-go. For fans of Green Lantern and the Stargate universe, listen to what some readers are saying. This is good stuff. Thanks for the new obsession. I recommend and can't wait for the next book. And the visual pictures and action are amazing. They're getting the band back together. And this time, it's serious nonsense. Pick up the Gateway to the Galaxy series by Jonathan Yanez and J.R. Castle. Available now on Amazon.com. There's a link to it in the show notes. Gateway to the Galaxy. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Jeffrey Ford on the show with me. Uh, I posted the uh, the cover of his new book on Instagram uh, a couple of times. It's Ahab's Return or The Last Voyage is the, uh, the subtitle. It's uh, a fantastic book. Imagine, if you will, uh, Moby Dick and that ending that we all know. Uh, but what happens if that was not the end of Captain Ahab? And this book is absolutely fascinating. Jeffrey has really nailed uh, the tone, that, that Melville tone, uh, and continues the story to what I believe is a much more satisfying ending. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you today, Jeffrey. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, Hank. It's uh, great to be here. Great um, to be talking to you. Well, thank you. Uh, you too. Uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh, back when I was a kid, I mean young, 
maybe four or five, my dad would read to us at night, me and my brother, put us in the big bed and we'd he'd read to us. He'd sit at the end of the bed and read. He'd come in after work from the machine shop, all smelling like oil. And before he had dinner, he'd come upstairs and he'd read to us before he went to sleep. And he read 19th century novels to us. And we were kids, but he didn't read kid books to us. He read us these 19th century novels like King Solomon's Mines by Ryder Haggard. And, you know, he had this set of books he bought. They were like the world's greatest literature, you know, maybe, maybe not. But, uh, you know, he would read, I don't know, all of these people, Hugo and, you know, those kind of guys. So that's who, that's what we grew up on listening to. And that voice was very strong to me. But one of the things that happened when he would read, I remember specifically him reading some book by Haggard, who's basically kind of fallen by the wayside these days because he's not exactly PC, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But it, he was a pretty exciting writer for, you know, the time when I was a kid and uh, adventure stories and stuff. And I remember uh, how vivid the images were in my mind from the words that he spoke. And I thought that was just like magic, you know, and I wanted to be able to create that. I wanted, always wanted after that to be able to make that happen. And so that was the first, that was my first entree into, you know, reading and, and wanting to write. And it's interesting you bring that up. Um, you know, there, that's uh, that's part of the, the greater conversation now is some of these older books and older writers uh, that are kind of portraits of their time, uh, but are not uh, the way we would like to portray ourselves or our society now. Um, do we do we get rid of those books? Do we stop reading them? Uh, you know, what kind of what's your take on on the older books that kind of make us uncomfortable now? Well, I mean, it depends on the book, really. I mean, so, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, pushback against somebody like Kipling, who I think is a marvelous writer. I mean, just one of the best short story writers going. I mean, so did Borges. He thought he was a great short story writer. And, uh, you know, he had a specific empire take on India when he was there. He grew up partially grew up there as a kid and uh, he told the stories. And he was aware of the, the the disparate nature of class and, you know, and uh, the, you know, the British Empire and, and you know, the, the place of peoples and so forth. Uh, and you get that in the stories. And you also get some stuff that our times would not be acceptable. But overall, I mean, the stories are still worth it. You know, like um, what's his name? The guy Salman Rushdie says about Kipling, he said, he said, there's, there's a lot in Kipling I can't forgive, but there's more I can't forget. And that's basically the way I feel about him. Another person like that would be Celine. All right. Celine is, a, you know, a French writer who was basically anti-Semitic, you know, and um, very virulently so. But you read his novels and the novels are fairly amazing. I mean, he there's once there's one part of his life where he smuggled these. Uh, children that were mentally handicapped out of Germany so they wouldn't be exterminated on a train. And part, that makes up part of this novel that he, you know, that he wrote. Uh, and those novels are amazing. But you always have to keep in your mind, you know, <laughs> this guy is, uh, you know, where this guy's coming from. Same thing with Newt Hompson, who also wrote great books, you know. But uh, you have to keep that in mind. Now, I think I'm intelligent enough to parse that. You know, and it's I think with fiction, it's reader beware. You know what I mean? So I think that's the reader's responsibility. Uh, if we stopped reading everything that made us uncomfortable and then we stopped reading everything that, you know, uh, that was slightly um, untoward as far as today's world went, there'd be a lot less books to read and there'd be a lot less to get out of them. Also, this stuff reminds you of the times, you know, of what was going on at the time and what the head was at the time. Then I'd say there are also books that are not worth it, that are not worth going back to because the the sentiments are just so vile that, you know, it's not like I would want to see them burned, uh, you know, but I just think, you know, those I would not bother with. You know, if I get a sense of that from a book, that's going to turn me off and I'm, I wouldn't want to read it anyway. But yes, I, I go back and I read some some books that have these elements in them 
And um, you have to be careful. You have to be aware. Uh, but you, sh- you, sh- you shouldn't, like, turn yourself off to what actually was going on in the past. Well, well, you sure. know, like, now we have a lot of people. We have certain people on one of the pl- platforms now. I, I guess they wouldn't kick them off. They were Holocaust deniers. Like, the Holocaust never happened. You know what I mean? Right. So that's people with heads in the, you know, their heads in the sand, you know? <laughs> sure, sure. So, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I think it's important to... Uh, to remember the the way things were and if we just uh keep keep burying them because we don't agree with them uh you know the the, the cliche if you if you uh you know if you don't remember the past you're you're bound to repeat it and i think that that holds out uh sometimes we need to see things that make us uncomfortable if if only to remind us uh to not be that way yeah 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 Doesn't, well, i agree with that yeah it doesn't mean you 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 dwell in it, but you know I, I think it's important to to see some things that make us uncomfortable sometimes. Also, in you know if you, you, you teach, I'm a te- I'm a professor in you know college, and sometimes those books are great to like to bring out those ideas, bring those you know through literature you can bring those uh, ideas to the forefront and people can discuss them, you know and and uh, and see what you know what's going on there. Whereas if you were just to bring them out. Uh, you know, in a social setting from like today's news or something, it might not be as easy for everybody to discuss them. But through a story, uh, you know, through an old story like that, uh, sometimes that's, you know, worthwhile. You have to be careful. That's the thing. And it's read to beware. And, you know, you're responsible for what you read. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And I don't, I don't think we talk about that enough, that that there is a responsibility uh, of the reader. And, and, and maybe we're we're not teaching critical thinking enough or uh i I don't know that this is this is a side tangent that uh i didn't mean to get no critical thinking is important it's important and it's something that just really doesn't get uh dealt with that often in high schools i think these days from what i see with incoming freshmen you know i mean these are smart kids and they're nice kids most of them uh but yeah the critical thinking element really is kind of lacking in in quite a few of them as far as i could see that and the idea of metaphor, man. Nobody's <laughs> teaching metaphor anymore. <laughs> I know that the, everything the, is just surface. It is what it is, you know. Everybody's so, so literal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they are good kids. I have yeah. to say that. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so, so your dad read these these old stories to you, and uh, I, I've tried to do that with my kids uh, as well. We we read all sorts of different series uh and i have boys and girls and 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 they all loved kind of everything you know we we just kind of read everything to them and i think it's important for dads to read to kids um uh so these things kind of came alive to you uh, as he read them to you at, at what point did you know uh that this was something that you were going to do well i remember when i was 8 or 9 i had gotten some notebooks the school and I got a school I bought myself like actually with some money I got one of those composition books and I started writing stories in it so I mean even back then I was still you know I was writing stories in this composition books I mean they weren't good but they were you know they were the stories that I could think of at the time you know so a lot pretty early on I mean it, it was pretty clear to me early on that I that's exactly what I wanted to do was write books you know what I mean write stories um, you you mentioned earlier um, uh, about Kipling uh, being a, a great short story writer, and uh, you know you have published a metric ton of uh, short stories. Did, is that how you got your start? Did you start writing short stories, uh, or is, was it yeah. something that yeah, you started dabbling good, in? It's a good way to start for most. I've I've taught creative writing quite a bit, you know, through the years, uh, different places and in colleges and stuff. And um, I think it's probably the best way for most people to go about it. I mean, there are really unusually, it's unusual. There are people who are just born to write a novel. You know what I mean? That's what, that's their thing. But for most people, because it allows you to learn the, the all the skills as you go along and to get the sense of how to, you know, yourself as a writer, your voice as a writer, and so that's a lot easier to do with stories where you can encompass, you get your mind around them. Uh, and I find 
I found it good, and it and it and it moved me into writing, uh, you know, longer fiction as I went along. But Kipling's great, man. Uh, he's really something. <laughs> uh, I'm a I'm a big fan of oh, yeah, absolutely. I, uh, Kipling. Uh, I I hope that uh, that we don't bury his works uh, as they age because uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from his storytelling uh, as well as from his stories. But uh, I'm I'm also a big fan of Ray Bradbury and I love that he was a staunch proponent of the uh, the the short story and encouraged people to write short stories. Uh, when when you began, uh, was was the short story was was that more viable than it is today? It seems like uh, short stories are becoming more marginalized. Maybe it's, it's the, the, the way the publishing industry is now. Um, you know, they're, they're well, you seem- see what it is. Yeah. The deal is, is like, I do a lot of my writing is in, uh, well, mo- all, mostly all my short fiction is in speculative fiction. You know, my novels are more like they, they straddle both the literary and the, and, and spec, you know, mystery and, and elements of fantasy in them and, you know, the fantastic. But m- my stories are all in, in speculative fiction. And one of the great things about that genre and those genres, uh, the subgenres, is that uh, there is a vital, vital, um, you know, short story market. I mean, you can make money writing short stories <laughs> in, uh, in speculative fiction. It's not like you're going to be a millionaire but you can make some pretty nice money. You know what I mean? Uh, writing, writing short stories. That's not why I did it. I mean, I do just like to write short stories, but I made some pretty good money writing those stories, actually, to tell you the truth. And uh, it, it keeps it vibrant. It keeps the field vibrant. And we have a lot of, that's a, a way where a lot of new writers come in, you know, through writing short stories. They'll write maybe five or six short stories, get a little bit of a name, and then they can go look into a publisher if they have a book idea. I've seen it happen a oh, hun- hundred times, you know what I mean? So that's not the same as, that's not the same as the MFA factory mill, you know what I mean, that mill. Uh, there's not a lot of money to be made there, and uh, it's limited. Uh, it's much more limited as to what's available. The other thing I found out was when I got out of school, uh, I was writing both speculative stories and stories for quote unquote literary magazines, you know? And um, then I just decided I'm going to put them together. You know, I'm going to put these two kind of styles I have together. But what I found, and they were a little bit like different, you know? So what I found though, was that the speculative magazines were much more willing to take a chance <laughs> on me than the, the lit magazines, you know? Plus I could make a couple of bucks over there. So it was, a, you know, it was a good deal. <laughs> it's it's almost like some of the MFA uh, programs are are teaching people to not make money. Um, it, <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I you know think, what the thing is, wh- one of the that? things I notice about them is I taught you know for a, a teacher um, not too long ago who was I know from that you know came out of that background and there's fabulous fabulous writers that come out of MFA programs you know. I never got an MFA. They didn't even have an MFA most places when I graduated, you know. Um, but one of the things I noticed was this woman on her, and I took over her class, this woman on her her uh, syllabus for a class in writing, like, stories, had the students reading 20 books. I was like, when the hell are they going to write? You know what I mean? <laughs> and the syllabus was, like, 25 pages long, And it was like, you know what, I I realized something. I realized something that these MFA programs to the rest of the college have to prove their worth. They have to prove that they're academically viable or something. So they trump everything up as if it's not enough to just know how to write a really good short story. You have to have all these books. You have to have all this apparatus around it. You have to have all this BS, you know what I mean, that comes with it. When really, if the, if it was on the syllabus, we're going to learn how to we're going to learn how to write a short story. I mean, I think that would be awesome if somebody learned how to really write a short story in a semester. That would be really something. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. So, so what is the key to writing a really great short story? If if it's not in you know being nose deep in in classic literature, um, how would you start coaching someone to to write a good short story? 
Well, my, my approach is, I guess, different than some people's. My, my approach is much more like, um, I guess it would, you know, I hate to use this word because it really doesn't mean anything these days. It's an old psych term, you know, sub, the subconscious. I, I work out of, the, out of like the subconscious and much more organically. I don't plan a lot. I don't take any notes. I never take notes on stories. I just let the stuff boil in my head, you know. But um, one of the things that I think people have to realize is they have to, they have to, you would think that with a story, you want to exert more control over the writing and, the, and how the story's going. But it's in, in reality, you want to exert less control. You want the stuff that's within you to come out because you'll get a good story out of it with all those things that you think you got to put in there, like light motifs and symbolism and all that stuff. If you just let take, you know, like you're driving a car, take your hands off the wheel and let the story develop and follow it. You get a good story. I, I studied with uh, John Gardner, the guy who wrote Grendel, you know, Grendel and the sunlight dialogues. And he used to say like, you want to affect like a vivid and continuous dream. And he would say, uh, you know, you find the character, just see the character. So you would sit around and think about a character and, or you wait for a character to come by. And then he'd say, follow the character in your, in your imagination, in your mind's eye, and the character will take you to the story. So there might be stuff in the beginning you got to get rid of. That's just the character getting you to the story. But then when the story starts, what you should do is you watch it, and as it unfolds, you just take down basically what you see and what you feel about the story. So as long as your craft is really honed and you're good at the, at the, you've gotten good at writing, you know, depending on how good you are in your style and the craft and so forth, uh, you know, if you are true to the story as to what happens and what you see, um, you know, uh, it'll come out, it'll come out good. Uh, the other, the, the other big problem people have when they start is they want the story to mean something. They want to, they, they want it desperately, they want it desperately to be profound, which is, you know, a noble, you know, it's, that's noble uh, consideration, but uh, there's no better way to kill a story than to uh, put all these demands on it as you're going through it. You know, like it's, you're, you're killing the, you're, uh, you're killing the characters, the characters are becoming puppets because you're manipulating them to some goal down the road instead of letting them basically live on their own. And this is one of the things that's different in my type of writing than other people's writing. I mean, I really believe that these characters are alive and having lives, you know, and following them. Uh, and w I found that as you go into the fiction and you see it and you follow it in your mind's eye, the world will open up around you. If you push into it, the world opens up around you. But I mean, if you're dictating to these characters what they have to do down the road, they're all going to lay down and die before the thing's over. Not only that, but you don't know still as the writer, and I prefer this, you don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know what's going to happen at the end. And what happens is your excitement of discovery as you uncover the story as it goes along will be transferred more readily to the reader, that sense of discovery. You know what I mean? Right. So right. that's, those are some of the things that, those are some of the things I talk to students about. And I know, I know, I know writers who are, um, you know, plot everything out, plan it. They have put your paper on the wall, wall with notes on it and everything. And they're fabulous writing. So it's just, you know, there are a million ways to do this. You just, you know, you got to find the one that works for you. Um, you, you talk about people that uh, that write and and have a uh, a purpose or looking for their story to have a, a particular meaning, and uh, those stories can come off really preachy and uh, you know it just reeks of of attempting to be profound. Um, do you think some of that goes back to what we talked about earlier and the uh, the the lack of uh, of metaphor? Uh, like we we've seemed to have lost our grasp of metaphor. Um, do you think that plays into that? Well, I think that problem has always been around. I think it's just people being conscientious, you know, and wanting to do something important in their writing. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing with the metaphor is I, I notice it's like people, 
uh, you know, people can't, uh, the young people, young people have a hard time. And it could just be the age too. When I'm an old fart and I think back now, I should have, I knew that when I was a kid, you know, maybe not, but it just seems like people can't think on more than one track at the same time. Cause that's what metaphor and simile do. They add, they add tracks to a, you know, a piece like things are happening on different levels, uh, you know, a, as you're writing. So the imagery and the idea, they're all, they're happening on different levels and yet it all blends together to, you know, to make the story. But yeah, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of emphasis on surface these days on, on, uh, just the surface of things and not what's at the depth of them, you know, what's in the depth, what's at the, the heart of them. And I think, uh, you know, it's, I think it's a lot of the, it has a lot to do with, uh, screens, uh, you know, with uh, computer screens and phone screens and stuff like that. It's what it is. You know, you get what you see there. So I could, that sounds kind of farty, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, I'm getting old, so. <laughs> so, Jeffrey, you, you started uh, writing short stories. What was the first novel that you got into? And uh, for you, uh, writing short stories versus novels, do you know they are going to be one or the other when you begin, or is that just how the the characters and their lives play out to you? Uh, the novels, I get it. It's a different sensibility. You know, I, it's hard to, for me to remember back to when I was started doing this. You know, now I ha- I'm in a I'm in a you know I'm in a mode where I I know which one's going to be. But I can't remember. But I know that I definitely felt differently about them because, you know, it's a novel's a long haul. You got to, you know, you got you got to really get ready. I th- I feel like I have to get ready for it, even if I don't. I don't know even know what the thing's going to be about. I mean, I knew with this book that it was going to be about Ahab not dying, <laughs> and then after right. that, I had to see where he what was going to happen to him, you know. And uh, but the stories. Um, the stories are easier for me in a way. The novels, I do a lot of research on novels, even though I say I don't take notes. I do a lot of ancillary reading, you know, on yeah. different ideas, even with the novels I wrote before I got into writing more historical uh, centered stuff. I still did research on ideas. You know, these were yeah. ideas that interested me at the time. And the novels do have ideas in them. It's not the kind of thing, though, where it's like I'm trying to push something. It's that the ideas just inform the background of the thing, you know, or it leads me to information that I can use in the book. So, you know, um, yeah, they're definitely different, definitely different. I don't, I well, can't tell you more than that, really. I'm sorry. I, I like that idea of, of, of research ahead of time uh, and just kind of immersing yourself in uh, – information uh, so that when you when you sit down to write you have something to draw from internally kind of getting in touch with that subconscious like you talked about if that stuff's not yeah. in there and and kind of mixing and melding with other stuff that you've read and taken in th- then something unique comes out of that i love the mix i mean that's why i don't take notes i don't want to commit any of that stuff to paper because you know i go to the grocery store i <laughs> do the grocery shopping every week and uh I'm squeezing melons and I, and then an idea pops into my head because that stuff's always up there bubbling or boiling around, you know, and mixing together and stuff. So I feel if I commit it to paper, it's, I'm going to, I'm going to separate it out and it's not going to be able to, I won't be mixing it in my mind with the other stuff that I have. Does that make any sense? <laughs> uh, that makes perfect sense. I, 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 I'm the same way. I, I like to, uh, if I start outlining something, I, I feel committed to that. But if yeah, I'm, yeah. if I'm reading this thing and maybe I watch this movie and, and maybe I hear a story about this, then something really dynamic and fresh comes out of the, the kind of the gumbo of all that stuff that's yeah, kind of yeah. brewing under there. You know, I I uh, I reached a point where I was writing fantasy novels in the beginning, and uh, I wrote like three or four of them. And my editor said, and I had I had an idea for another one. I was gonna, you know, try and sell them. And my editor at Harper Collins, she said to me, "Well, you know what? I want you to place this one in the real world. I want you to try that at a particular time. Pick a time and place this story in the." I, th- what I had was like some kind of Hoffman esque, like Germanic tale type thing. 
And she goes, I want you to, I want you to set it in the real world. So I was like, bummer, because it now it seemed like homework, you know, I had to right. figure out what the hell was going on then and there. But, you know, once I got into that, man, I love that kind of research, that historical research, because what happens is you'll find things that resonate with the idea you had. And it just adds to the, it adds to your understanding of your own idea and discoveries of things that you can use in the story and work them in and stuff, you know, and that really became, that was such a great suggestion that I hated when I first, (laughs) first got it. (laughs) But what I learned about, what I learned about that kind of historical writing is a little bit of that stuff goes a long way. You know what I mean? You've got to pepper it. You've got to really lightly pepper it in there because otherwise it just, I, a book that I find uh, overdoes it is, which is a good book, is The Alienist. There's so many touchstones in that book that it becomes, I don't know, kind of, you know, uh, pedantic in a way. But you got to really like, you got to really like, you got to get it in there like, um, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. Because overdoing it, then it becomes like leaden, you know? Right, right. That suggestion from your editor to anchor something in the real world, uh, what, what did that become? Oh, I wrote this book called The Portrait of Mrs. Charbouk. It's about a, it's about a guy, this painter, who uh, kind of like, I guess he's kind of based on um, oh, who's, what's, uh, what's Whistler, you know? Uh, he, he's got to paint the portrait of a woman he's not allowed to see. She sits behind the screen, and she hires him to paint her, but he's got to paint her from the story she tells him about herself. And, you know, obviously, like, She's not really telling him. I mean, the story she tells him are bizarre, you know what I mean? Wild and stuff. And then he's trying to find out on the side, like who she is and what about her. It develops this whole mystery. So, you know, uh, I had, I got the idea from um, Emily. I teach taught Emily Dickinson for years and her brother's lover, uh, a woman who had, who was married actually, who her brother was having an affair with, Mabel Loomis Todd. Uh, I had read this thing where she said that she had never seen Emily Dickinson, although she'd known her like half her life, but she'd never seen her except in her coffin because Emily had a tendency to hide when people came over and sit up around the stairway. And like when somebody would play the piano, you would hear her applauding, but no one would get, you know, you wouldn't see her. Yeah, so I figured, and you know, she she often sat behind the screen to talk to people. So you know, these are all the anecdotes about Dickinson. I don't know if any of this stuff's true. So there was a guy in my town who was a famous portrait painter. He just happened to live there. This old guy, and I went and talked to him one day uh, at a basketball game because his grandson was on the same team as my kid. I said to him, I said, what do you think about this idea? This, this woman who, uh, you know, he, this guy has to paint her portrait, but he can't see. He goes, that's the stupidest thing I ever. <laughs> <laughs> I said, solid, I'm doing it. Yes. <laughs> that's what that's... clinched it. I was like, I'm going to do that. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, <laughs> several of your books uh, and stories, uh, maybe even a good many, uh, tend to to be kind of darker fantasy uh and and really dealing with some uh uh you know maybe some the the darker parts of our subconscious uh a natural history of hell uh, the short story collection and then you've got a a, a trilogy uh the well built city trilogy is is kind of darker uh yeah what what is it about those kinds of themes uh, do you think uh, excites you or maybe kind of uh, bubble to the surface? I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, these are parts of, I guess, parts of my nature, um, things I want to explore. I, um, I don't know. I, one of the things that always pops up in my stories is um, about people being outcast or being an outsider, you know, in some way either through race or through, uh, you know, something wrong with them or, uh, you know, as perceived by society, there's that element to them. Um, and that seems a dark thing to me. Uh, you know, some, something I've experienced and, um, you know, it's trying to express ideas about that. 
uh, the physiognomy is about that, you know, to a large extent. And the, that trilogy and the stories are too. Um, I don't know. The one thing about it though, is there's always humor in my stories when they're dark. Right. I mean, I, I read a lot of, I see a lot of stuff by newer writers now and, and I'm, I'm connected through the, into the horror genre through the work I do a lot for Ellen Datlow, you know? Um, and, um, they, they have a tendency to, to believe that, uh, when things are completely grim with no humor, they're more profound. But it doesn't work that way. They just become really duds, you know, because they just everything is grim, you know. You got to leaven that stuff to make it uh, to make the horror in it come, stand out. There has to be something about real life in there, and real life is not, you know, real life is not completely grim for most people. Uh, you know, in any situation, I've been in some bad situations and usually there's laughs involved at some point along the line, you know, maybe not in the final, but there's usually some laughs in there. So, um, the other theme that I have a lot is my stories have a tendency to have oddly mixed up families, uh, groups of people who have to come together to do something, you know, to to do a task or to reach a goal. That's that's just stuff I've noticed as I've gotten older. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, let, let's talk about the new book, um, uh, Ahab's Return or The Last Voyage. Uh, this is... Um, this is new territory uh, for you, for for all of us. Uh, we've got this uh, this classic uh, by Herman Melville, um, Moby Dick, and... You know, we've all read it. We all know the story. Um, and, and these, these characters are kind of larger than life with Captain Ahab and, and Ishmael. Um, and you know, that the ending to that book is, is, is kind of open. It, I think we all assumed what happened, uh, to Captain Ahab and then what would happen, uh, to Ishmael and, and, you know, we, we kind of imagined this continuing story in our minds collectively, uh, although we didn't know that. Uh, but it's this assumption that just kind of becomes larger than life. Um, what drew you uh, back to the story and made you want to uh, tell the ending that 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 had not been assumed? Well, first of all, I just want to start out by saying uh you don't have to have read Moby Dick to read my book. I want people okay. to know that. <laughs> if you know who Ahab is and the white whale, solid. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can go into my book. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's, that's one thing I'm worried about. People will be put off if they've never read Moby Dick. You don't have to go. People say to me, oh, I better go read Moby Dick. I was like, if I'm going to wait for that, I'm going to be an old man. So, you know, you don't well, really and- need to know that. It's, it's kind of an autonomous book in itself. If you have read Moby Dick, though – that's definitely going to increase your enjoyment of the story, you know. Anyway, well, and, I don't and know to what the, got me into. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was going to say to the to the publisher's credit, um, it, you know, Moby Dick is not uh, is not really referenced on the the cover, back cover, uh, or the the flap. I don't really think. Well, I mean, in in the inside flap, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it it looks as if you know it's it's a, a new story, um, so. So yeah. hopefully people don't get tripped up on that. It's got a manticore on the cover. Yes. Yeah. My kid drew the manticore. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. That is I think amazing. it's a good one. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so, you know, I, I read Moby Dick a few times, you know, because I taught early American lit. So it's something I should have read. And, you know, I did listen to it on tape uh, once. And uh, I'm by no means, a, a, you know, a Moby Dick scholar. I, you know, I don't I, I'm not a scholar of that. But I know a lot. I know enough about it. I know a lot about it, actually. And, um, you know, I, I was sitting there one day and I realized, like, after I read it recently and I realized, you know, like Captain Ahab, man, he goes overboard, but we never really see him die. And uh, it's one of those books that by the time you get to the end of it, you just, you know, you don't give a damn one way or the other. You're just he's dead <laughs> because it's such a long book. Right. So I was like, I bet no one's ever, I bet no one's ever taken up to see what happens, what actually happened to Captain Ahab. 
And I found like nobody had. So I was like, oh boy, that's like, I was walking around with like this big secret, you know, not like anybody else wanted it. But um, that's what started me on it. And I thought to myself, well, you know, Captain Ahab in the book is, you know, he's like uh, larger than life. He's melodramatic. Everything he does is like he's on a stage, you know. Uh, as Harrow, the main character in the story who tells the story, says he, he struts and frets his hour, so to speak, constantly in the book, you know. And because Harrow has read the book, because Ishmael's alive in this world, too. So it's like the world of the of the story as if Ishmael, who tells the story, wrote the book. I don't want to get too confusing, but that, that's what's going on. Yeah. Uh, so so you start wondering what to, what happened. Uh, how do you how do you immerse yourself into this world uh, to to start pick to pick the story up? Because you absolutely nailed that voice, that tone. Um, it's uh I, I don't know. You know, it's a, you just fall right back into the story with this book. Well, you know, the, 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 the character of Harrow is good because it allows me to tell the story. If I had to tell that story through Ahab's voice or in a third person point of view with Ahab, I, I don't think I could do it. It would have to be as ponderous as Moby Dick, you know. So uh, Harrow allows me to do that. And Ahab, he's not. He, he's a main character in it, but he's not the only character in it. So I get to leaven it, you know, with other concerns and other characters that were involved in Moby Dick, or at least some of them were involved in Moby Dick. So Harrow is the key. And what he is, is he's a writer of, uh, you know, humbug. Like he writes for one of these penny press magazines at the time that, that, uh, traffics in, you know, uh, outre and, uh, you know, bizarre stories. And there were a lot of them at that time. Uh, big That was big stuff. Like, you know, they, a lot of the writers were influenced by them, like Poe, by the stories in those magazines about live burials and that kind of stuff, you know, um, and, and fantastic voyages uh, and people, you know, and other places and lands. All the writers in early American lit were, were influenced by that, uh, from, uh, you know, Emerson to Thoreau. Dickinson, you know, in their work, that stuff comes out. So that's one of the play. That's one of the reasons I used him as the character. Plus, he, I kind of commiserated with him because what I write is basically speculative fiction, you know. Uh, so it allowed me to be in the story, and I could be closer to Ahab and you know talk to readers about what he's doing. I don't know. It just felt easier that way uh, to to you know to be 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 in that world through that character how i came up with them i don't know it just when i started <laughs> writing i just had the voice you know what i mean it just came right. but i did a lot of research at the time plus my old man reading me those 19th century books oh yeah that pays off in silver dollars because that's in the back of my head now i can't get rid of that voice you know uh and even though he's reading me british books i mean a lot of that stuff the the the, the sentence structures and stuff carried over you know well, I always ask people about their early memories of, of wanting to be a writer and, and about things that they read because I, almost always there's a there's a story of that coming full circle um, that those things that we're exposed to when we're young those early things that really excite us they they always bubble back up uh, in, in our writing and the things that we do later in life it's uh, it's almost universally true it's it's kind of scary. You know, I was just thinking about this the other day because I'm thinking about another book, uh, you know, doing another novel. And I just remembered this story, you know, these stories I read of uh, shipwrecks, you know, shipwreck stories, uh, island stories, you know. I just the other day and I went out and I bought a couple of books to read, uh, you know, but there was this one book I read in grade school that was written by Jules Verne about these kids that are stranded on a desert, you know, deserted island, uh, shipwrecked on a deserted island and i thought you know um i wonder if you could still do a shipwreck story and get away with it you know what could, what would you have to do in it to do it so it, it seems like a fun idea so I, I i was you know picked up the lord of the flies which i'd never read and you know some of the other books galapagos by kurt vonnegut and i'm going to go through those and see uh you know i've read uh, i was i'm a big fan of defoe's uh robinson crusoe and Michel Tournier's Friday and, you know, those things. So 
I think there's enough stuff out there that might give me a good idea, you know? But you're right. It goes back to these stories I read as a kid, you know? Yeah, I I would love to see what you do with a shipwreck story. Like, uh, uh, because uh, I've thought about that too. The the things that, uh, that scared us so much or the things that really captured our imagination when, when over the water, uh, was a completely different world. And, and now that the world is small because of the internet and, and satellite maps and all of that kind of stuff, can we still tap into those fears and those, uh, you know, w- the, the tension that's brought from that? Uh, I, I, I can't wait to see what you come up with. Yeah. Because, you know, having the, having the sense of a historical aspect to it, uh, just to, to, you know, to set it in the past, um, you can really get fantastic with that. You know what I mean? That you can bring in all kinds of fantastic stuff that could have possibly happened and maybe, you know, uh, outlandish fan- fantasy, just like in, you know, in, in the Moby, in the Ahab book. But, uh, yeah, th- I see a lot of possibilities and I shouldn't have said anything now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't steal my idea. Yes. Hank. No, I, w- I won't. I promise. You, I won't. I'm just um, yeah. Uh, you you mentioned earlier that uh, that your stories have this thread of, of kind of odd family situations that go through them, and um, yeah. And I, I don't think I would have brought this up if you wouldn't have said that. But Ahab's return uh, has an element of that because uh, Ahab is looking for his family, and uh, you know they. They assume that he's dead, and he's he sets out on this adventure. And and really, this book to me is an adventure book. He's he's out looking for, uh, for his lost family, and and he goes through all of these places and situations, and and there's peril, and uh, you know, is he ever going to find them? Uh, but there's this family tension uh, under there. Uh, what yeah. what made you want to tell that part of this story? I don't know. I guess you know my family. I guess. I was thinking about this the other day. My family had been through some hard times, you know what I mean? Uh, when I was a kid and we, we had to really kind of pull together. We didn't have a lot. And, um, it, 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 um, I guess that comes through, but it's been in other books too, but they're odd families. Like they're not like, you know, they're not regular families. Like in this one, you have like that woman who's the transcendentalist and, the kid who's the uh, bodyguard for the, you know for the publisher and all that stuff they all kind of make up like this unit that's kind of like a family but the same thing happens in um the girl in the glass one of my novels which is about these grifters who put on séances for rich people during the depression uh you know it develops into a mystery and it's made up of like a kid who's a mexican who they pass off as a hindu swami <laughs> and um, a giant guy from the from like the sideshows, uh, and you know a woman who and, and this woman, but yeah, these people who are kind of loners on their own or castaways create like a family situation. I don't know. I, I, it's something psychological in it for sure, <laughs> but I can't figure it out. I love it. Well, that's and and that's part of why we write, isn't it? To to kind of yeah yeah dig deep and figure those things out and. You know, the thing uh, is, yeah. if you figure this stuff out, you wouldn't have anything else to write. I, I know, I know. So it's 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 kind of, it's good that we're a little messed up, you know that, uh, yeah. and, and that we stay just a little messed up, you know, not enough to scare yeah. the neighbors, not enough to scare the neighbors, but just a little messed yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, Jeffrey, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I love the book. Ahab's Return is is just phenomenal. It's, uh, uh, you know, and and like you said, I I don't want people to be put off by its connection to Moby Dick because uh, it's it, well, first off, it's about half the size of, of Moby Dick, uh, and it's yeah. a it, it's just a fascinating read. It's really fun. Uh, it's uh, there's lots of humor. There's lots of kind of wry humor like uh like the things you mentioned a minute ago with the kind of the the shenanigans going on uh behind the scenes uh but it's just a fantastic book um so i i'm uh, encouraging everyone to get a copy of it i think they will absolutely love it thanks a lot hank yeah yeah um if if people are just discovering you and your work uh where can they find you to to maybe dig into your back catalog and and learn more about what you do well i have a site online uh, you know, I have a, a, a web page online, The Well-Built City, uh, that has a lot about my books. And uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Uh, on Twitter, I'm Jeffrey Ford 8. On Facebook, I'm just Jeffrey Ford. 
And, uh, you know, if you, uh, my books are on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and they have quite a lot, you know, they have pretty much all of them on those things. And, uh, you know, they, people, you could see me around, somebody put up a Wikipedia page that has a list of my stuff on it. So, um, you know, I'm there, I'm out there, find me. <laughs> I'm waiting to be discovered. <laughs> well, We'll definitely put a link to uh, to your Amazon page and uh, into the wellbuiltcity.com as well hyphen builtcity.com uh, and and send everybody to see you. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Yeah, listen, I had a great time. It was a great conversation, Hank. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. He was just seven when his parents died. Eliza received the news of their death on Halloween morning, but she kept it from Jason for two more days. She sent him out trick-or-treating. He was a vampire. He spun around in the living room, eyes wild, shouting, I am the living dead, and wondering why they didn't laugh. On November 2nd, after school, Eliza told him. His parents were dead. It was a bleak time. He wanted silence. He wanted darkness. He cried great, rolling tears. In early spring, he ran away from home which means he stole five dollars, put a box of Cheez-Its in a pillowcase, and walked seven blocks. He slept in a field, glad to be miserable. He wanted to freeze to death, to be with his mom and dad, to not feel anything. His grandmother found him at a playground near the river, fallen in the dust with his shoulder against the slope of a teeter-totter, the other end riderless, suspended. He saw her trudging up the hill. She looked twice her usual size in her winter coat, and frightening. Let's go home, Jason. He knew he was in trouble. He knew what home meant. It meant a paddling or worse. Eliza opened her big winter coat and, straining, slipped down into the dust next to him. She drew him into her warm body, wrapping him in the coat. She flipped the collar up, rubbed her hands together, and cupped them over his ears. Burr, you're an ice cube. But it feels good, kinda. It's good to get really cold sometimes. Wakes you up. They were cheek to cheek against the teeter-totter, bundled together as the sky turned from gray to orange. The ground stung, but they sat a long time. Why? The word was just a tiny puff of vapor that slipped from his lips and into the wind. But it was also big. Big and heavy. She knew what his little boy heart had asked. She understood the universe of longing and confusion and hurt in that one whispered word. We all die, baby. In all the long, long history of the world, there's not been one of us who didn't. I'll die, he said. It wasn't a question, but it was. Yes, and I'll die. A lot sooner. And the why is just... It's just there. It just is. We're not around to see what was before us, and we're not here to see what happens after. The trees on the edge of the playground shivered with dawn. But we're here now, she said, and pulled him tighter until his cheekbone felt sore from pressing against hers. And it has to be enough. It has to be. Look at all we have now. Really look. He really looked. It was just a small playground off the main road of an unimportant New England town. But in the distance he could see the wide Kennebec River, and the sky was pink above it. He saw small ships moored, trimmed in red and baby blue, rocking against the current. He saw a robin on the railing of a dock, toes pointed inward, making occasional hops that were also flight. The town was waking up. There was a light in the bakery and one in the grocery. There was an empty can of beer on a picnic table and wildflowers by the road. There was wind and trees swaying gently. There was his own breath in his own lungs. 
There was his grandmother, her body, her heartbeat against his back as he leaned against her chest. There was his own life and hers and a world to live them in. And it was enough.